Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to welcome you and, um, and uh, all of our guests. First of all, let me say that the State of the Union uh, has given us a tremendous opportunity to empower people across the country who are, who are demanding that the Congress act to strengthen our gun laws. Uh, I especially want to thank today the, uh, the survivors, uh, uh, those who have shown so much courage uh, to be here today to tell their stories uh, throughout the day and, and uh, this evening. Uh, now, I believe, is the time for us to show the same kind of courage uh, and tackle this issue uh, as, as members of Congress, as these families are showing and sharing their personal stories. I also especially want to thank my colleagues who have joined me uh, today in, in asking our fellow representatives uh, to give their one State of the Union ticket uh, to someone who has been impacted by gun violence. And you're going to hear from, uh, of course, our, our guests uh, in, in just a moment as well uh, as some of the members. But I want to recognize my colleagues who have joined me uh, in, in organizing this effort, uh, particularly Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy, uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLore, and Congressman David Cicilline from my home state of Rhode Island. For all of us uh, who are here, and, and I also, I, I'd be remiss, I also want to recognize uh, Senator Murphy and Senator Blumenthal, both from Connecticut, who have, who have joined us. Uh, thank you. And, and you'll be hearing from uh, several other members, both from Connecticut and around the country, who will be introducing their guests in, in, just, in just a moment. For all of us who are here today, this issue is personal in, in some way. In my case, uh, the gun accident that left me paralyzed was not, uh, thankfully, uh, an act of violence, but what, uh, but in fact happened uh, in a police locker room uh, when a gun being handled by two weapons experts on the police SWAT team, uh, and when the gun had uh, discharged. Uh, this shows that uh, more guns is not the answer to keeping our kids uh, or folks in our community safe. Now we all know too well that uh, obviously difficult political obstacles threaten the chances of enacting responsible legislation to better protect our communities and especially our children. However, the vast majority of the American people want us to improve gun safety. For our effort to be successful, our elected officials must hear our outcry and they must hear the stories of those who have been impacted by gun violence. They are the people that are here today who are going to be speaking, uh, as I said, are showing tremendous courage. And as members of the House and the Senate, we need to show that same kind of courage and enact responsible gun laws in our country. So we're here today because the people behind uh, me can most powerfully send that message that the status quo is unacceptable. So with that, um, I thank you all for being here and uh, to give some brief remarks. And I know we have, a, uh, unfortunately, a, a very tight uh, time frame. We only have about 40 minutes because some of our uh, families have to uh, go up to, uh, to another event. We're going to try to do this uh, as, uh, as expeditiously and, and uh, briefly as possible. But uh, it's important now to hear from Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy. Carolyn. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to all my colleagues for being here and the senators who certainly have faced uh, the tragedy uh, on what happened in Newtown. I'm not going to spe uh, spend much time talking. Uh, I'm probably on one of the older victims uh, here, and I want you to hear from some of the others. Uh, I want to just talk about the person I invited, John Aresta, chief of the Malvern Police Department. Uh, his, his uncle was killed um, on the Long Island Railroad with my, with my husband. And he also lost a partner, a police partner, New York City Police Department. So he has gone through this twice, and I'm glad that he was able to come and make it today, and I appreciate everything that you do and continue to do uh, to keep gun violence down. But I want to thank also the Mayors Against Illegal Guns, uh, because they are definitely making this possible to bring everybody together. So with that being said, I, I really just want to say to all the victims, um, we will go forward. And we will fight for all of you. Amen. And we will. Uh, but I have to say, you know, many of us have been fighting this issue for many years. Right. And I'm sad to say that we have 
new members that are joining this crusade because we have more new victims. And I think that's the saddest part. But thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Carolyn. Congressman Keith Ellison. Nothing I could ever say could approach the eloquence <clears throat> of the people who have had direct impact from these horrible incidents of, of gun violence. Uh, in my own life, uh, I've won a tremendously valuable friend. His name is Sammy Ramahim. This is Sammy, and the picture he's holding is of his father. Sammy and his dad were incredibly close, and uh, Sammy's dad and I were friends, too. But a tragic incident of gun violence affected his life forever when a disgruntled employee suffered from mental illness, came into the workplace, and let loose with a barrage of guns. He had 6,000 rounds of ammunition. Oh. And uh, bottom line is that Sammy, 17 years old, high school student, uh, heard about the tragic incident, heard about a shooting incident in the neighborhood, emailed his dad to be careful. What he didn't know mm. is that that email would never be replied to. <clears throat> Sammy, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for the courage you display, and thank you to everyone here. Thank you. This has been a, uh, it has been and it is a partnership uh, with a lot of us uh, joining together, not only as, as members with, with the victims, but also uh, with um, the Mayor's Against Illegal Guns. And I'm, I'm very pleased uh, uh, that, again, many of our guests tonight's speech and, and other survivors and family members in this room uh, here because of the uh, uh, mayor's uh, organization this week uh, to advocate uh, for change is uh, that we all want to see. And I'm pleased right now to, uh, to bring up Mark Glaze, the director of the Mayors Against Illegal Guns. I want to thank Mark, and I especially want to thank uh, Mayor Bloomberg for, for his efforts and putting his prestige behind the line. And let's give him a round of applause if we could, uh, even though he's not here. Thank you, Congressman uh, Langevin. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I also want to thank Congress Congressman Ellison, who has been a wonderful partner in this work. And, uh, of course, the woman who is an inspiration to all of us as we uh, continue to push this rock up the hill, which I think we will get to the top this time, Congresswoman McCarthy. Uh, I also want to give a shout-out to two people, and then I will get off the stage and let the survivors tell you their stories. But I want to uh, thank Virginia Mayor Tom Menino as our fantastic partner in this work, our co-chair in the great city of Boston. And also to David Cicilline, who, before he was David Cicilline, was Mayor David Cicilline <laughs> from the great city of Providence. That's where Rhode Island, that's Rhode Island, right? Yes, yes. Right. <laughs> One of our original 15 mayors. Uh, so we are 875 uh, and more mayors from all across the country, uh, small towns and big cities, uh, Republicans and Democrats and no party at all who are very diverse but unified by one thing, which is the belief that we can respect the Second Amendment and the rights of law-abiding gun owners and do much more to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Um, and that is basically where the country is today. I think we have reached a point where it is appropriate to stop pretending that there hasn't been a broad and durable consensus about what the right answers are on this issue for two generations. Most people believe, 79 or 80 percent, that there is a Second Amendment right to have a gun in your home for self-protection. An overwhelming majority, more than that, also believe that every person ought to get a background check before they can buy a gun. Right. Large majorities believe that assault weapons have no place on our streets, that high-capacity magazines aren't necessary for hunting for self-protection, and the police don't have them, by the way, by and large. <coughs> now we're having that discussion. Uh, and leading that discussion are mayors, our law enforcement leaders, our clergy, our university presidents, all manner of people who, for the first time, are really taking a hard look at this issue and realizing that something has to be done. We know what the some things are, and they're actually not going to be that hard to do when members of Congress do them. They're going to face Election Day, wake up the next morning, they're still going to be in office. Uh, and I think after that, there's more progress to come. We're honored um, to be often led in this work um, by the survivors of gun violence and by the families of those we lost. That's okay. We brought, I think, 120 of them, along with our colleagues at the Brady Campaign, uh, to Washington to tell their stories. Um, and they represent many more behind them, because every day in this country, 33 more Americans are murdered with guns. 12,000 any given year, 48,000 in this president's term, unless Washington acts. 
That doesn't count, by the way, accidental deaths, suicides, and many other ways that people die from the improper use of firearms. So they come representing themselves, and they're telling their stories, but they also represent a great league behind them of people who died at the barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. often unnecessarily, when we knew what the answers were. Mm -hmm. It's time to change that. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Congresswoman Rosa DeLore, one of my other partners in helping to organize this effort to give our one State of the Union ticket to uh, a victim of gun violence. And Rosa, if you'd say a few words. Thank you very, very much, Jim. And we are grateful to you for uh, initiating this effort, as well as uh, ca to Carolyn and to Keith and to David. I'm proud to join you. And I just might add, I'm really proud. Well, all of the folks who are here, but I, I will mention our two senators, Senator um, Murphy, Senator Blumenthal, and also we'll mention Congresswoman Esty, whose district uh, uh, is where the, the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School um, uh, is. And um, Mark Glaze, the Mayors Against Illegal Guns, Dan Goss, Brady Campaign, the guests who have joined us today, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for the courage. Um, we know that you continue to grieve. Does it make it? any difference how long that time period is, you continue to grieve and to take uh, that adversity and, 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 and take it in order to promote a, a, the common good uh, really is, is admirable. Uh, I will mention N Newtown, it's two months ago. It, it continues to be almost overwhelming, yes, um, a slaughter of the innocents. Yes, it was a normal Friday morning right in the midst of the holiday season, Sandy Hook Elementary School suddenly, and without warning, became a war zone. Within minutes, a young man murdered six adults and 20 children in cold blood, devastating the small town community and breaking millions of hearts for the families, but millions of hearts all over this country. And among the victims was Vicki Soto, 27-year-old first grade teacher from Stratford, Connecticut. When the gunman began firing, Vicki hid some of her class in the closet and then was murdered trying to protect the rest. Vicki is a hero, and she died protecting the young children in her charge, leaving her parents and three siblings. Her 15-year-old brother, Carlos, will be with us tonight. He's my guest. He is among the siblings, the parents, the families, the co-workers, the friends, and the victims of violence themselves with us for the State of the Union. He's here to remind us that victims of gun violence all have names, they have faces, they have families who love them, and we should remember and honor them by putting an end to this. That's right. There are approximately 30,000 firearm-related deaths that occur every year, 1,700 more since Newtown. And when I talked to Carlos after the tragedy, I'll just tell you anecdotally, he picked up the phone. He's a sophomore in high school, Stratford High School. His parents didn't know. He called and he asked to come in to see me. And I obviously said yes. And he said to me out of his mouth, what are you going to do? That was his first question. <coughs> what are you going to do? That's the question that the American people want us to answer. It's the responsibility of this Congress to answer them. We owe it to the Soto family and to countless others right. to prevent guns from falling into the hands of violent criminals, to get dangerous assault weapons off the streets, That's to improve our mental health system, and to give law enforcement what they need to keep the public safe. We can wait no longer. We can wait no longer. It is time for the Congress to work with the President and to act. And I thank you, and now I have the honor to introduce Dan Gross, who is president of the Brady Campaign and the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Dan's family has also been touched by this epidemic. Sixteen years ago, in February 1997, his brother, who was here, was severely wounded in a shooting at the Empire State Building. After that incident, Dan co-founded the Center to Prevent Youth Violence to prevent other families going through the same trauma. He took over as president of the Brady campaign last year. Dan, thank you for being here, but thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Congresswoman DeLauro. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be standing next to Congresswoman McCarthy. We've been 
doing this work together for so long and to see it on the precipice of such change is uh, so inspiring and you're always so inspiring. And uh, it's inspiring to be here with uh, the elected leaders that are uh, stepping up at this critical moment and it's especially uh, an honor and inspiring to be here with, uh, with all of you. Um, the familiar faces, you know, we've, a lot of us have done a lot of work together and um, you know, what, what this is all about is honoring your loss um, by making sure that we do what we can to prevent it from happening to other people. And um, you all are the ones that are gonna make a difference on this and uh, it's inspiring to be with you as always. Uh, I'm Dan Gross, I'm president of the Brady Campaign. Like too many though, I'm also a victim of gun violence. This is my brother, Matt, who um, was shot in the head in the shooting that happened on the observation deck of the Empire State Building in February of 1997, and our dear friend Christopher Burmeister was killed um, in that shooting. Uh, and that event has changed the course of certainly of his life, as well as uh, all of us who love him and care about him, as these tragedies tend to do. Um, in my case, I've dedicated my career to doing what I can to prevent, prevent gun violence. Uh, it's really one of the most significant uh, epidemics that we face in this country. It's a crisis. Every day we lose 32 more Americans to gun murders, 90 to gun deaths, <coughs> hundreds more are wounded uh, in our homes, in our streets, in our schools. We can do better than this, and that's why we're here today. As the president of the Brady Campaign, I proudly represent the voice of millions of Americans who just want to live in a nation that's safer for all of us, especially our children. An American public that knows that we can do better than this and wants action now. The White House has shown tremendous leadership, putting forth a plan that will save lives, will prevent tragedies like ours, and now we're turning our attention our passion, and our voices to Congress. I thank you, Congressman Langevin, for your leadership as well. I also want to thank Congressman Lowenthal, who has invited Peggy McCrum. I'm not sure if we're going to hear from her today, but Peggy, um, um, Peggy also uh, was impacted through her sibling, losing her brother, Robert Kelly, in a tragedy. Uh, shooter still hasn't been found. Um, but like all the others that you see here today, she has turned her tragedy into inspiring action and what will be, we are confident, meaningful change. Um, we also want to thank Mayor Bloomberg and Mayors Against Illegal Guns for um, your extraordinary generosity and leadership in bringing all of uh, these folks here today and, um, and, and really demonstrating the power that we have when we all come together as a single voice. Um, and also I want to thank Senators Lautenberg and Gillibrand, who I don't believe are here, but um, they gave my brother and me the extraordinary honor of being able to um, have their tickets for the, uh, for the State of the Union tonight. And uh, to the dozens of families that are here and the millions across the country who have been touched by gun violence, we want you to know that we will be representing all of you. All of you. Thank you. That's awesome. In the end, uh, protecting our children and our most vulnerable citizens and making this a safer nation is not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's an American issue. We can do better than this, and we can do it by working together in a bipartisan way. And that's why we're here today, to make the voices of those touched by gun violence heard, to call on all members of Congress to do the right thing, to rise above partisanship, and pass real comprehensive solutions to make this the better, safer nation that we all want and deserve. Thanks. Yeah, good. Dan, Dan, thank you very much for sharing your story and for your, your leadership of the Brady campaign. Obviously, your story, uh, as, as are all of these, uh, these stories from hearing directly from those who have been affected by gun violence, are, are so powerful and ultimately is what is going to, to make a difference and actually see meaningful gun legislation uh, enacted. And I am so grateful to President Obama for his leadership, his being, being so vocal uh, and visible on this issue and taking it on so early on in his administration. And I'm anxious, as we all are, to hear what he's going to say tonight in the State of the Union address. 
But obviously what's, what this is all about is about the families, about protecting our children and people in our communities. And to lead off the effort right now to introduce uh, uh, those who have been directly affected uh, by gun violence uh, is my colleague from Rhode Island, uh, who will introduce the, uh, uh, his guest in, uh, as the first speaker. Uh, David was uh, the mayor of our capital city of Providence and did a great job there. He's been an outstanding uh, addition uh, as a member of the United States Congress, uh, someone who has uh, made, uh, throughout his career in public service, uh, made, it, uh, made it a strong effort in, in ending gun violence and uh, as mayor and as uh, now a congressman. And I'm proud to introduce my colleague, Congressman David Cicilline. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Uh, first, I want to just acknowledge the leadership of my senior colleague, uh, Congressman Langevin, in, in organizing today's event. And uh, to say to all of my colleagues in government, thank you for your leadership. Carolyn, as a young state legislator, you are an inspiration to me, and the work continues. So I want to acknowledge and thank all of you. I particularly want to thank all of the individuals who have joined us today uh, who are going to give powerful testimony about the devastating impact of gun violence and communities and families all across this country. We hear these statistics, some of which we just heard, and they're almost incomprehensible. You know, 20 times more likely to be a victim of gun violence uh, in America than any developed country in the world. Uh, 1,700 more deaths by guns since the tragedy in Newtown, and on and on. But behind each one of those numbers are real people. And um, I hope that part of what happens today is we raise the consciousness of our country to the devastating impact of gun violence on families and we rate and really call, use this as a call to action to our colleagues in the Congress. If our colleagues can demonstrate one fraction of the courage mm -hmm. of the individuals behind me, we will pass You're responsible here. gun safety legislation. Yes. Well said. Yes. Well said. Yeah. And I now have the great <laughs> honor of introducing uh, Cleora O'Connor, who I met uh, many years ago, and in fact met her uh, when she lost her 17-year-old son, who was a bright, shining star, wonderful young man who was a member of the South Providence Boys and Girls Club, uh, their basketball team, uh, and he was 17 years old and was shot and murdered while sitting in a car in the South Providence neighborhood of our city. Uh, she became very active in gun violence protection after that, uh, beginning in 1999, and by going online and searching and learning about the Million Mom March, she attended a rally here in Washington and eventually became co-chair of the Rhode Island chapter of the Million Mom March. And we worked together when I was in the General Assembly. But I remember very distinctly uh, going to Cleora's home uh, when she lost her son with the city councilman from that neighborhood. And as a mayor of a city, that was the most difficult responsibility I ever had was to talk to families who lost loved ones to gun violence. Um, there are no words that can ever convey comfort to a grieving parent. I want to just say thank you to Cleora for being here tonight and today and for being willing to share your story, uh, not only to everyone in this room, but to our country. <coughs> thank you, Congressman Cicilline, for continuing your fight that you began in the State House of Rhode Island as Mayor of Providence and now here in Congress. I'm here as a voice for my son, Malik, who at 17 years of age lost his life due to an act of gun violence. 16 years ago next month, a piece of my heart was taken from me. But it seems like yesterday. Since finding my voice three years after his death, I've been active in many initiatives, including co-chairing the Million Mom March, the Rhode Island chapter, and as a board member at the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence in Rhode Island. Yes. I'm driven by the fact that we need to diminish this proliferation of guns on our streets and teach peaceful methods of conflict resolution. It's not that difficult. It's not that complicated. We need sensible gun legislation. Again, we need sensible gun legislation. Don't let this be your child. That's right. Let's keep this conversation going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Next, if I could have uh, Kirsten uh, Sanima uh, from Arizona come up. Uh, she's going to introduce uh, her guest, uh, Emily Nottingham. Uh, we are in the, uh, the Gabe Zimmerman room here today, and uh, Emily is the, uh, uh, the mother of Gabe Zimmerman, for whom, uh, again, uh, the room we're in uh, was named. Congresswoman. Thank you. As a native Tucsonan, it is my honor and privilege to introduce today Emily Nottingham. Emily is the mother of Gabe Zimmerman. And as noted, we are all privileged to be here today in a room that honors his memory and his dedication to this country. And I thank members of Congress who worked hard to make this happen. Gabe Zimmerman was a social worker, like myself. When he graduated from the School of Social Work at Arizona State University, Shortly thereafter, he took a job working for our own beloved Gabby, Gabby Giffords. And just 25 months ago, he was doing what he loved best, which was serving his country, his congresswoman, and the citizens of Tucson by doing what he did every single day, which is helping people solve their problems and increase their quality of life. We all know that on that day, he was shot and killed, along with so many others who were killed and wounded. Gabe's memory lives on, not only in his mother, Emily, but also his fiance, Kelly O'Brien, who is here with us today and will be with us this, tonight, this evening. Emily Nottingham was certainly an inspiration to Gabe in his career and his life's path, for she served for 30 years as the community services director for the city of Tucson. Clearly paved the path for Gabe to do the great work that he did in our community. Please join me in welcoming Emily Nottingham. Thank you and good afternoon. The people standing behind me were either survivors of gun violence or loved somebody who did not survive. My son and Kelly's fiance, Gabe, was murdered while he was working for a member of Congress doing his job in Tucson two years ago. But what I want to recall about Gabe today is his love of Washington, D.C. I first brought him here when he was nine years old, and what he liked best that trip was the metro, which he rode back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But he came back many times after that as a youngster and then as a young man. And he, every time he came to D.C., he was like a kid again, and he loved the museums and he loved the memorials uh, and he loved the buildings. Uh, on his last visit, which was for the first inauguration of, of President Obama, he spent a full day at the museum and uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. And he took a picture of the Lincoln Memorial and put it as a screensaver on his computer at work so that he could see it every day and remind him about what it stood for. Because what, why Gabe liked and loved Washington, D.C. buildings and memorials uh, and museums was what they, because of what they stood for. The best of government, the best of our government's ideals. He believed, and he was not naive, he knew that, that government processes are long, politics are messy, uh, but he believed anyway that eventually our legislators stand up and do the right thing for Americans. And I believe that too. And the people who stand behind me also believe that. And they believe that that can happen now about gun violence or they wouldn't have traveled such long distances to be here today. And standing behind them are people back in our own hometowns and our states who also believe that right now Congress can act, step up, and govern. Please don't let us down. Thank you. If I could ask Representative Lois Frankel to come up to introduce um, the parents of Grace McDonald, uh, Lyndon Christopher. Thank you. Lois Frankel from South Florida, former mayor uh, in the group Mayors Against Illegal Guns. And uh, I uh, invited um, the mother of Grace McDonald here because I wanted her to know and the other families here to know that people all over this country are grieving for them. And I wanted a Lynn McDonald, and she's here with her husband. I want her to be able to look into the eyes of my colleagues 
And I want them to tell her, yeah, yes, we can do something to prevent these tragedies from affecting other families. Uh, so I'd ask uh, Lynn, thank you for being here. Thank you. My name is Lynn McDonald. On December 14th, we lost the love and light of our family, our daughter Grace. After that day, I made a promise to her that I would be her voice. I promised Grace that I would be fearless in my efforts because that is what she deserves. I want Gracie to be celebrated, to be heard, and to be remembered. Remembered as a beautiful artistic soul who wanted to live on the beach and be a painter. Through her art, we will celebrate her vision of the world as a beautiful and peaceful place. And by my presence here today, it is my sincere hope that she will be heard. We are strengthened by the president's resolve and deeply appreciative of his commitment and sense of urgency. We hope others guided by their own moral compasses will also feel the need to act and act now. I would ask our representatives to look into their hearts and choose action over inaction. We owe that to our children and we owe it to our daughter, Grace. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Representative Brad Schneider, who will introduce uh, Cleopatra Pendleton. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Brad Schneider from Illinois' 10th District. It is my distinct honor to have invited Cleopatra Cowley to this year's State of the Union. And I am pleased that she and Nathan tonight will be sitting with the First Lady and that her family is here today with her. <coughs> Cleopatra is an incredibly powerful voice, joining a chorus, an increasing chorus of concerned citizens who stand with everybody here to say we must reduce, we must stop gun violence. Her daughter, Hadia, only 15 years old, was an honor student, a majorette in the band, and had walked in the president's inauguration parade shortly before being shot down. As a parent, her murder is, is heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So together we all must call on Congress, right. on our leaders to begin addressing gun violence. Yes. No parent should have to suffer the loss of a child to senseless gun violence. With that, I would like to welcome Cleopatra. Hydea <laughs> um, was a 15-year-old student, um, as Brad expressed. And, you know, she loved basketball, volleyball. Uh, debate, um, her friends, like every teen ager does. Um, she did nothing wrong, went to the park, and never came home again. I'm here today because my daughter never came home. I'm here today because she lost her life to gun violence. I'm here today because gun violence affected my life and has affected the rest of my life. No one should feel the way we do. And I'm appealing to the Congress to be smarter than me. You guys signed up for the job. Do something. Yeah. You can. Cleopatra, thank you so much and for your courage. <coughs> Can I ask Congresswoman Janice Hahn to come forward to introduce Reverend uh, Win Winford Bell? Thank you. Well, I stand here today with my colleagues, with our guests, with victims of gun violence in this country from the streets of Compton, Chicago, to the shopping malls and schools in Newtown and Aurora. And listening to these stories this morning, I know, and I hope every member of Congress knows, that now 
is the perfect time to pass common sense gun violence prevention that will be necessary to protect our children and our families from fu future gun violence. I decided to give my ticket to Reverend Bell, who's a pastor of Mount Olive Second Missionary Baptist Church in Watts. You could probably tell he was a pastor. He was the one up here going, my Lord, amen, <laughs> hallelujah. We don't usually do that at press conferences. <laughs> but I think, I think it's appropriate to have those expressions uh, today as we listen to these stories. And he's going to tell you uh, about his story. And his son was a victim of gun violence. And his personal at call to action and is why I'm wearing the silver and black ribbon, which represents a silver lining of hope. And maybe, just maybe, every dark cloud that is hanging over each and every one of you, the silver lining will be that finally, finally, Congress does the right thing when it comes to passing common sense legislation. This is Reverend Bell. Thank you. To Ms. Hahn and certainly to all of you, my heart is overjoyed to be able to see that congressional leaders and men and women of faith are fighting to make a unique change in our society. For more than 30 years, we've been crying in our urban cities that these killings must come to a close. Three and a half years ago, my son was shot. Nine times they shot at him point blank range, but God spared his life one bullet entered into his right hand, and from that, it gave birth to a group called Civil Line of Hope Crusade, which is a collaboration of churches, pastors, lay people who are fighting to change our society. Every child has a right to grow up without the fear ever being cut down. That's not going to happen on its own. And the congressional leaders cannot do it alone. We all must own this process. And that's what we're doing. So when we wear this black and silver ribbon, that's what we're saying. 32,000 people in California are now wearing this ribbon because they believe by faith that God can intervene. And we don't talk too much about Jesus Christ these days. But Jesus is the one. He has the answer. Jesus said like this as I go to my seat. If they'll do this to a green tree, what do you think they'll do to a dry tree? Now, we some dry folks, but we can come alive. Yeah. I said we can come alive and we can change our present situation. My heart goes out to every victim that's here that their child has been killed. It has not been lost. That child was taken. That child was killed. And we must call it as it is. It's a devastation. And I close by simply saying you will never be the same if they can take your child. It will destroy you. It will mess you up. And so congressional leaders feel our pain, feel our passion, feel our desire to see this thing change. And we can do this together. By God on our side, we can make a change. Thank you, Reverend. Amen, Reverend. I agree. Uh, Mike, uh, Congressman Mike Thompson, who is the... Uh, uh, the leader of the, uh, the Gun Violence Task Force in the, in the Congress uh, couldn't join us today. Uh, but to introduce his guest, uh, Alvin Daniel um, uh, McHenry is uh, Mark Glaze from the, the Mayor's uh, Against Illegal Guns. You're really telling me I have to follow? Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. I have been um, talking about Zena Daniel, I think, every day since she was <laughs> shot on October 21st, my birthday, um, at the spa where she worked in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Um, her uh, murder was a particularly clear and devastating case of what we call in the jargon the private sale loophole and a devastating <coughs> example of what people behind me know but what many people at home don't know, which is that guns are what make domestic violence disputes exceptionally lethal. 50% of women who are murdered by an intimate partner do so with a gun. And in states that require background checks, for all gun sales, that number drops off sharply by 38 to 40%. This was not one of those cases. Um, in Wisconsin, uh, Zena had gotten a restraining order uh, to keep her estranged husband away from her. As a result of that active restraining order, he was federally prohibited from buying or possessing a gun. 
Knowing that, he went to armslist.com, mm -hmm. which has, on any given moment, 20 to 25,000 guns for sale mm -hmm. and helpfully allows you to screen between whether you want to buy from a licensed dealer and get a background check or an unlicensed private seller mm -hmm. and not, which is a little bit like creating two security lines at the airport, one with a magnetometer, one with that. He bought, went to a private seller, met the seller, bought a Glock, went to the spa where Zena worked, mm -hmm. murdered her, two of her colleagues, injured seven others, and turned the gun on himself. Jeez. That's Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. In Michigan, they've closed this loophole. A background check and a permit are required to buy a handgun from a private seller. This murder would have been much more difficult to perpetrate just across the border. Zena's brother, Elvin, is a hunter, an NRA member, and he's dedicating some part of his life to Zena's memory and to this work. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. It's okay. Okay. Take your time. Thank you. Take your time. I am here to speak for Zena. Yes, sir. Since she's not here to speak for herself. That's right. I'm going to honor her name. <coughs> and in honor her name. We do need to do background checks on people. The president is definitely on the right track. <coughs> um, Zena was full of goodness. All she wanted to do was be a good mom and raise her kids. Didn't have a chance to do that. She was full of goodness, and some good will come out of her death. And this is the time, the place. Thank you. Thank you. Elvin, thank you for sharing your story. Next, if I could ask uh, Congressman uh, Alan Lowenthal to come up. <clears throat> and, Al and Alan will introduce uh, Peggy, Mc Peggy McCrum from Long Beach, California. Thank you, Congress member. As a member of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force and as a proponent of President Obama's recommendations, policy recommendations to reduce gun violence in our communities, is with great admiration and respect that I introduce Peggy McCrum from Long Beach, California. Three decades ago, Peggy's brother was shot and killed at the age of 28 in Los Angeles while he was walking to his parked car. The killer was never found. But Peggy didn't stop after going through a recovery from this, of this horrible situation and surviving the loss of her brother. For the past five years, she has demonstrated her activism in Long Beach as the chapter leader of the Brady campaign to end gun violence. Peggy's brother was a graduate of California State University, Long Beach, where I taught for many years, and he was a longtime resident of the area. He had his entire life in front of him until it ended abruptly by a senseless act of violence. My Lord. Robert was denied a full chance of life by a complete stranger. He is survived by a loving family who refused to stand by as others are forced to endure similar tragedies. His sister Peggy stands here today in support of the plan put forth by our president to end gun violence now and forever it is with great respect that I introduce Peggy McGraw. Thank you, Congressman Lowenthal. I'm here today not just for my brother Robert, but for the thousands of innocent men, women, and children who are victims of gun violence. On behalf of the Long Beach chapter of the Brady Campaign, I am here to ask every member of Congress to take action. There are many avenues we can take to stop gun violence in our country, but we certainly cannot choose the avenue of inaction. Now is the time for Congress to act. Now is the time to demand a plan. I'm honored, here to, I'm honored to stand here today with Congressman Lowenthal, who is part of the solution joining his colleagues in Congress to propose common-sense solutions to this issue. 
which has caused too much heartache, too many tears, and simply not enough action. We all deserve the freedom. Sorry. We all deserve the freedom to be safe from gun violence, and I applaud the congressman and everyone here today for their efforts in actualizing that freedom. We should not stop until we see real, tangible solutions to the issue of gun violence. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Congressman Keith Ellison is going to now introduce his guest, uh, Sammy Ramey. Yeah, I just want you to observe that we come here from different parts of the country. We come here from different walks of life, different colors, different cultures, different faith traditions. Mm -hmm. But we're all absolutely united. Come on now. In our commitment on, to bring safety to our communities. Some of us have lost children. Some of us have lost siblings. Uh, my guest, Sammy, uh, lost his, his father. And Sammy, I want you to know I'll never forget that beautiful twinkle in your father's eye. He was an amazing man. And I want you to come tell the folks what you have to say. <coughs> Sammy Rahim, everybody. Gun violence in the United States is a much bigger problem than the shooting that killed my father. It's a much bigger problem than Virginia Tech, it's bigger than Aurora, it's bigger than Tucson, and it's bigger than Newtown. Whether gun violence enters your life in a mass shooting or in a single victim murder, the pain is no greater or nor less. I've personally had the opportunity to thank President Obama, Pres uh, Representative Ellison, Senators Klobuchar and Franken for their leadership as my elected officials in the gun violence prevention fight. I would like to take this opportunity to thank them again. As the president has said, if we can even save one life from a death of gun violence, we have the obligation to try. That's right. That's right. That's right. However, I believe if we pass the Fix Gun Checks Act, ban assault weapons effectively, and limit high-capacity magazines, we will save many more than just one life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. <laughs> Finally, our, our last speaker uh, today, and, and uh, I know there's so many others that, that want to, to speak, and because of limited time, we're, we're going to have to, we're coming to a close. But my guest uh, is Jim Tyrell from my home city of Warwick. He lost his sister nine years ago who was... Uh, tragically uh, murdered in 2004 during a robbery at a convenience store that she owned uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, the gunman has never been found. Uh, today, to honor his memory, uh, he is, uh, is my guest uh, at the State of the Union, and he's going to share his story. Jim, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. What an honor for my sister Debbie and all these other victims over here. When I was asked to come down here, and be a small part of gun control in honor of my sister. What a gift, what a gift. So we asked you people out there in Congress, you, you say to yourself, well, this didn't happen to me, and it didn't happen to me, but I say to you, it could happen to you, That's right. and it might happen to you if you don't help pass this. That's right. Here, here. So please, give us your support and stop gun violence. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. As you can, you can tell, these are all incredibly personal and powerful stories, as they are to, to all of us. We're all here because we care passionately about ending the gun violence in our communities. We call upon our colleagues in the House and Senate to join with us in a bipartisan way to pass meaningful, meaningful gun safety legislation getting our, these assault weapons off our streets, these high-capacity gun magazines off of our, our streets, and, and passing uh, meaningful, uh, thorough background checks for anyone that is purchasing uh, a weapon. Together, I know that we can make a difference, and uh, I'm so grateful to all of my colleagues for stepping forward, and for the victims here who, have, who are willing to share their personal stories to help make a difference to see that we pass uh, this legislation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.